Welcome to today's session, uh, Quality Online Course Series, content, course content and instructional material. My name is Dan Cabrera. I'm the Multimedia Coordinator for Faculty Development. I've actually asked my colleague uh, Cameron Wills to join us today. He's pr uh, providing uh, technical support for individuals who uh, may have difficulty coming into the session, um, and I appreciate that. He'll be around for about 10 minutes. Hey, there you are. <laughs> okay, Cameron, great. Today's session, uh, let's look at the workshop objectives, and there are two distinct areas today. By the end of the session, you'll be able to discover and create content and instructional materials which contribute to your course learning objectives. And we're going to spend the first half of the session discussing that. And the second objective is to communicate the nature and the use of course content and instructional materials to your students. So let's focus on discover and create. So I'd like to ask everyone, um, which of the following do you use for your course, for your instructional materials in an online course? And responding to this would be uh, something you could do in the chat area. Okay, we talked about, I think everyone is familiar with the chat area. So which of the following do you use for instructional materials in an online course? If you want to say, yeah, textbooks, articles, e-reserves, videos, multimedia, oh, all of the above. Absolutely, and that's, of course, a... Uh, 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 Yep, yep, yep. All right, so maybe <laughs> uh, that's important to be able to identify those areas uh, of content that you secure. But I have a follow-up question that I really need to ask you. Presentations? Okay, great. How do you know which one to use? What's the primary motivation or what leads to, what drives your decision to uh, to select certain content, uh, certain types of instructional materials versus others. So I want you to think about that for just a few seconds and then maybe respond. I see that we have uh, oh, student engagement. Absolutely, it's probably one of the primary ones. Thank you so much, uh, Niyati. Uh, one of the primary um, uh, methodologies or strategies or approaches to, to selecting your content. I wanna help uh, Natalie I want to help keep them interested, mixing it up with that. And I, I, I think you sort of uh, hit on uh, a point early on, something that we, we will be talking about, the use of variety, not just in terms of the modalities, whether it's a lecture, whether it's an article, whether it's a video, but also the perspectives. I know that at my own course, uh, I don't like to have just stuff that I have created, that I have worked on, or that I have selected. I, I like to, to have, in fact, occasionally material that actually um, questions what I say. And I want my students to be aware of that, that you don't really accept as gospel uh, everything that the professor says. So it's really important. And, and I agree that by doing that, that you get more credibility uh, from students you know, who, who uh, recognize that you're saying that there are other voices um, and that you want to do this to keep them interested, to engage them, to continue with, uh, with the learning process. Okay, so one of the primary determinants of what content you choose is the learning objectives that you have selected, that you've, you've created. And of course, there are, there are module level objectives, overall objectives, and there are specific objectives for a particular lecture in a module. You have to ask yourself whether the instructional materials are aligned with the course and the module level objectives. So the course objectives are the overall objectives of the course and the module level objectives are those that are specific to a particular week or, or, or unit or session, however you break up your, your course. And so in this particular example, we're gonna be looking at an objective that looks to identify examples of formative and summative evaluation. And in this example, we have come across a video that actually does a really good job of identifying those examples of formative and summative evaluation. And so that really provides us with uh, a, a good starting point with the content. It may be that you, a YouTube video is one piece of uh, instructional material that, that supports this. However, there might be other, other instructional materials that also support it. So we're always looking forward to not just one as the be all end all uh, content. But although this particular workshop is not focused on assessments, that is the logical next step. So we start with our objectives, uh, and then we have an instruction materials that support or are aligned with the objectives. And then we have some mechanism of assessing uh, reaching the objectives. And in this case right here, we have a discussion board assignment, probably with um, a forum topic that actually tests information, tests 
uh, whether in fact the students have gotten it, have, have, have actually been able to identify the examples of formative and summative evaluations in some way. Okay. By the way, I want to mention, in support of what we're doing for this workshop, I want to call your attention to the bottom area here in this slide. Uh, so this slide contributes to the achievement of the workshop objective. So our instruction material is, in fact, the slide presentation. And our objective is to discover and create content and instructional materials which contribute to your course learning objectives. All right. The only thing we don't have in this case is a follow-up assessment, whether you learn the material or not. But uh, we're just following best practices. So as you are creating your instruction materials or discovering instruction materials, it's really preferable to use some sort of mechanism like the one above to help us in this process of selecting uh, appropriate information. So this, this particular table where uh, in, important information uh, is collected it was actually developed by Stephanie Richter. This is one, one of her courses. Uh, my colleague who is the Director of Faculty Development, she's identified a series of module level objectives. Okay, and that would be right here on the left hand side, module level objectives. And we've taken different kinds of instruction materials across the top that you might use in an, in an online course. And so we have textbook chapters, we have created videos, found videos, probably YouTube videos, um, and, uh, and journal articles. And then we've checked where uh, we think each instructional material fits into the course and how they align with module objectives. So that we're looking for that every objective has instructional materials that go along with it and that they are varied. Okay, so if we look at exploring, this is one module objective, explore the logic of program evaluation. And in this case, we have more than one um, instruction material item. We have a textbook chapter that's aligned with this objectives. We also have a journal article. Okay, and I'm just sort of uh, identifying that. It could be in, when you actually do it, you might identify the specific journal article that, that we're referring to. And the second module objectives is to define the pur purposes of program evaluation. And once again, we're using a textbook chapter. It could be a portion of a textbook chapter. But we also found a video that actually addresses this, that is aligned with that particular thing. So we're not using a created video. We found a video, an existing video. And uh, we, we ha are not using a journal article because it may not be appropriate. Third item here, the third module objective, is to identify examples of formative and summative uh, evaluation. And in this case, there might be I guess, a perceived gap where there is not instruction materials that exist that supports this. So it may be that we create our own video to sort of identify that. However, as you can see, if we look across this table, uh, we did find an article that is supportive of this, that aligns with that. And lastly, to select an appropriate model of evaluation for a real-world program, in this case, we have three instructional materials items that we're including. A created video, something that already existed, a found video, and a, uh, a, a journal article that's very supportive of it. I just want to emphasize that if you find that uh, you do not have any instructional materials for a specific objective, then maybe that's time for you to go and create your own content. So a question I want to ask you is, how do you currently find your own course content or materials? And this is actually a real question. I'd like you to maybe share some of that. I see that Matt is typing. So Matt, how do you currently find your course materials or instruction materials? Well, Matt is typing. I'm thinking of ways that I do it. You know, there's, there's actually a plethora of uh, strategies for finding information. Uh, that's appropriate for your course. And sometimes it's easy, sometimes you'll be amazed at the plethora of available information, and other times it's, it's more challenging. And, and in fact, you may uh, find a relative dearth of, of existing content. And that means that you are uh, probably gonna be creating a lot of your own material or some of your own material. So we have Natalie. Natalie says, I'm often gifted materials from others who have taught the course, and I can adjust from there. Absolutely. I, when I first started teaching here in 1996, I was gifted with an existing textbook and a, uh, a syllabus. And of course, over the course of years, I modified the, the syllabus. I've changed the textbook a number of times. and But I was very grateful for having somebody else's at least initial vision on teaching the course. Uh, and I had the opportunity to, to make changes as appropriate. 
Uh, Matt says, uh, colleagues' suggestions, uh, listservs for, for legal research sources, and browsing all materials that we have uh, available at NIU. And those materials could be uh, fellow, fellow uh, colleagues, as Matt already had mentioned, or the library, which is also have a lot of uh, existing uh, materials. Bill Goldberg says he reads journals. And he gleans his information from those journals, internet research, library resources, and asking colleagues. And so we see some familiar themes here, looking online, uh, asking uh, colleagues for, for information. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Natalie. OK. So if we're talking about discovering instruction materials, uh, we're looking for a way to sort of make uh, make it a little bit easier for us to create, to curate, to combine, to collect information that's going to be supportive of, of our material, but more specifically the learning objective. So if we're going to, if we're going to start with this discovering of uh, instructional materials, perhaps uh, it may be that somebody else has created an instructional material for a particular learning objective. And we'll look at this learning objective here on the slide. Select an appropriate model of evaluation for a real world program. So you might want to adapt it, or you might need to tweak it uh, in some way. So if I go down this list here for perhaps maybe finding an appropriate instructional material kind of, I might actually initially look at open educational resources. OK, open educational resources is a great online source that collects information from, from a lot of individuals who are actually just posting content to share with others. And of course, they may share the content with some stipulations, but at least it's an opportunity for you to start. So I'm going to look at OER, uh, OER for resources. So on this slide, there's some content that was uncovered in the Open Education Resource Commons.org website. Just a few things into this adding uh, in, in, in this particular uh, situation. I'm, uh, I might have created a, uh, a search uh, strategy. And so in the search engine, I might type some, some information. And I was able to get find content that, that fit my specific learning objective. Now, there are a couple of things that really should be scrutinized when assessing content. The first would be that the subject and the level of the content fits. And in this particular case right here, the subject is social science, OK? Because I might be looking at this aspect uh, in my course, social science, that is supportive of finding a model of evaluation. And then uh, also look to see that the education level is appropriate for my students. Now, I'm, it, it would be post-secondary, OK? Now, we're, we're not looking for a high school level. We're looking for post-secondary. Our students, some challenges, of course. We might be saying, yeah, we, we uh, in our class, will be asking for the materials to be in English. And it may actually say we, we want to have some reading materials, although we might actually have some opportunities for finding video if it exists. You're also looking for Creative Commons attributes so that the person who's created the uh, this material has permitted others to use this. Uh, and if I look at this right here, we have Creative Commons. And so the individual saying, uh, uh, is allowing us to use this. And in fact, he's allowing us, or she, is allowing us to use uh, the content with no strings attached. So it may be that I create this, uh, uh, that I make some changes to the existing uh, content because the, the owner uh, or the author of this material has made it possible for me to be able to, to do that. All right, so another area for discovering instructional material is other online resources. And it could be that you do a Google search. You might uh, go through your Twitter contacts for collecting information. But in, in either case, you really need to ensure that these resources are accurate, that they're salient to your content, and that it is appropriate scholarly work that you would, of course, have vetted. You would have gone through it. You would have reviewed it and decided whether it's appropriate or not and accurate. Because our focus really is in giving our students quality material. We really want to ensure that. University resources could be, as I think we've already mentioned before, colleagues in the field in our, in our departments. The university library has a mountain of available resources that we can also draw from. And finally, textbook and publisher content. And I want to sort of highlight this because sometimes this is the first place that we look for drawing our information from. We'll, we'll get our content from, from the textbook. Uh, sometimes there are uh, quizzes that come associated with a particular textbook or maybe some, uh, some assignments that the uh, publisher of the textbook provides for our students. 
And although that's probably a first uh, initial one, I, I would be leery of just accepting just that is all there is. Um, because, as you know, as, as you know, been teaching for a while, you can actually create a lot more and make it much more engaging for your students by looking for other sources as well. Okay, other considerations when selecting instructional materials, the content absolutely should be relevant to the learning objectives. I think we've hammered that enough uh, up to this point in the session. If they're not al uh, aligning with the objectives, then it's possible that we're selecting inappropriate materials. And of course, you know, if you're really doing a whole alignments thing, you really want to have that learning objective and it has to be aligned with, with instructional materials and ultimately has to be aligned with assessment. So the content really needs to be relevant to, to the learning objectives. That's uh, initially what we have. Content should also represent up-to-date thinking or practices in the discipline. And sometimes we have material that we've been using for a few years, and it's it's time to make sure that that whatever, depending of course on the nature of uh, of the discipline, whether we need to update our materials to, to keep it current. And it's current so that students really know that you know what you're talking about and that you're keeping it real with with the students. So, for instance, last year there was this incident where a nurse was uh, protecting the rights of an unconscious patient in an emergency room and a police officer came in to secure a blood sample to determine if that patient was uh, drinking alcohol or not. I mean there's a lot more to the story than this uh, but that violated the official ethics code of behavior for the nurse and I, and I, I do teach a course on ethical decision-making for healthcare professionals and it was so relevant to what we were discussing, I immediately included the story uh, in my course in the appropriate location. Uh, however, you know, sometimes there are historical or seminal materials that really need to be preserved. For instance, you're not going to be uh, changing or updating the Declaration of Independent or the U.S. Constitution if you're teaching a course on history. Or maybe there's a seminal article in your field that actually is so pervasive and was such a game changer uh, that you want to maintain it even though it may be a few years old. However, if you are perhaps getting an article, another article that isn't either historical or seminal, but that it, it's related to what you're talking about. But maybe it was uh, created in the 1990s. That probably is a little bit too old for what you want to do. Of course, once again, talking about the relevance uh, and the accuracy of the information, but also needs to be uh, with, with your field. I want to reemphasize that the content really needs to be relevant to the learning objectives and it must be kept in focus when we're selecting our instructional materials. So that's sort of a, a review of that. Content should also be varied and offer multiple perspectives. And I think I already alluded to that earlier on, where we have diverse voices. Uh, and so the, I may have a certain position uh, in the courses that I teach, but if I just keep that as the singular uh, focus, uh, then my students would get the wrong idea that everyone in the field thinks this way. And so it's important to have diverse voices and, and, and in some cases voices that are not in uh, sharing the same perspective as I do. And in fact, uh, in a very real sense, I think that's something I want to try to encourage so that students know that, uh, you know, there are perhaps more than one opinion requires understanding, distinction, being able to determine what are the, what are the good points, the good features and the bad features of a particular uh, approach. Also different modalities, and different modalities uh, simply is, is a way of presenting information in different ways that can keep students engaged. So although you may have lots of reading material, it may be that you want to have some, some changes uh, every once in a while. So you might, you might want to have a, a video that promotes uh, the same type of information, or maybe just a different perspective to make it uh, interesting. Uh, or have a lecture rather than a textbook uh, that actually shares some information as well. So having diverse voices and different modalities is also very important. But I'm going to ask you, what are some other things that we might want to consider when we're selecting our instructional materials? So I want, to th I want you to think about that. So if, if you had to make a choice in, in terms of, of what you want to include, what might these other aspects be? Uh, the importance? Absolutely. Something that actually has direct relevance to what you're talking about. The importance of the information. I think uh, Niyati is, is doing some more. How much they will be using it in future courses or feel as well? Very, very good. Thank you so much. 
and got some more people. Uh, Matt says, materials can provide practical experience if possible. Thank you, Matt. And uh, Niyati says, because there's so much information, it's impossible to fit, <laughs> to fit it all. Absolutely. You have to make certain decisions as to what uh, information will be included. So another thing to consider is accessibility, whether the information is accessible, or screen readable, or in fact, if cost is another uh, consideration too. Because if students see that you're asking them to purchase a $300 textbook, they may think that you have no concept of uh, the challenges that students have to do. So when you make requests uh, for students to purchase content, like a textbook, cost should also be something in, that measures into the equation. I'm going to ask you though, now the question is, what is still missing? As you proceed to evaluate and discover content, you may find that the material that you don't address, that the materials that you find don't really address the specific learning objective that you have. Uh, for instance, you may find something is not completely accessible, as I mentioned before, or it's much too expensive. Uh, okay, so what is missing? That's the question we want to ask. Well, what's missing is maybe something is, it isn't addressing all of your instructional, uh, instructional objectives. So after you've gone through the process of discovering the content you want to use, it may be that there's still something that's missing. And it could be that you find that your own voice uh, isn't included in the di diverse content. So you may, yeah, you may feel that you need to insert your own voice. And so if I have a lot of information, that's the textbook, that's articles, research articles, that's journal articles, that um, are videos or some online uh, websites, it may be that I'm not having any input in this. And that'd be, that would be of some concern to me. So let's continue uh, using this example of the evaluation theory and models and applications that we used in the previous slide. Say I found some videos, some journal articles, and some textbooks, and I really feel good about them, but then I'm missing my own voice, and I'm connecting the dots uh, that I would like to do between the instruction materials that maybe just doesn't get done with the this other material that I've discovered. So I'm going to think about creating some presentations to perhaps fill in those gaps, and maybe I'm going to make a little bit, uh, make them a little bit different, and I might even use a different modality. So maybe I, I wasn't entirely thrilled with uh, an online presentation because it turns out it wasn't as, as, as on point as I thought it was. Or it may be that I'm not even allowed to use them because, uh, because of fair use laws. Or maybe they're not accessible. So I'm going to have uh, to address that by creating my own uh, presentation. So it could be that I'm creating several presentations um, and I'm uh, maybe releasing them in a synchronous session like we're doing right now in this in this session uh, and perhaps maybe because it, because it's it's live uh, I can provide information to students and students may ask questions so this is kind of sort of like just in time at session uh, which of course is another option rather than having an entirely asynchronous now we have a synchronous session I also might need to create maybe perhaps uh, a faculty blog and I can feature several different modalities. For instance, I can have an article to share with the students. I can have a video that I, that, that I create. Or I can have a, other information, maybe perhaps an article that I'm thinking of writing, to include in this particular uh, scenario. In this piece right here, this table, I'd like to mention the need to evaluate instructional materials. Now, this particular uh, table or rubric was created by my colleague, Tracy Miller. And she created it to evaluate uh, uh, open educational resources. Okay, now you can see that she has a number of criteria uh, on the left-hand side, and the rows across are, are the level of accomplishment or, or achievement. I'm looking at the instructional material, or even uh, maybe I'm creating my own instructional material. Whether it's something I've, I've discovered or, or I'm created, I'm going to look at how well it meets the learning objectives. So I'm creating a nice variety, allowing students to have diverse voices in the instructional materials that I'm adding to my own online course. And so I have learning objectives. Is the resource ideally matched to the learning objective or needs of the students? If it does, it would exceed expectations. However, if I go to the opposite, the extreme, where it's below expectation is that this resource is not aligned or marginally aligned with learning objectives or needs of the students. Probably in using this rubric, I would decide, man, you know, this, this content is not appropriate and I'm not going to use this. 
So I would be focused mostly on either exceeding expectations or meeting expectations. Uh, in the area of variety, and so I'm having uh, individuals um, uh, receiving content that is that is varied. So in this particular case, the research contributes significantly to the variety of instructional materials. It might be a recorded lecture, it might be a video, it might be an audio sound, it might be an article. So uh, all these that support learning, but also in a way that, that is in multiple areas or multiple varieties or modalities so that students maintain their interest. Uh, is the information, uh, the instructional materials current, historically, or seminally uh, relevant? And is the material have a fair use requirement? And is it accessible for all of my students with or without uh, any modification? So I want to make sure that, that if the material uh, is posted, it maybe it might be a PDF, is it screen readable? Or uh, are there closed captions associated with the video that, uh, that are a part of the material that I'm using? And this may be material that, that I didn't create myself, but that exists. However, if I'm creating my own material, uh, I'm really going to make sure that uh, it is accessible by including closed captions. So at this point, I want to ask, are there any questions on discovering and creating instructional materials? I'm looking. I don't see any questions. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to start looking at our second objective. And that second objective is to be able to communicate the nature and the use of course content and instructional materials to your students. Okay, so not just posting content, but actually providing a, a rationale for using the content uh, uh, for your students. So my question to you is, why do you use instructional materials uh, that you do? Why do you use the instructional materials that you do use? Okay. Now, I'm, I'm sort of cheating on you a little bit here because I'm giving you an answer. Now, it's, I'm saying it's the correct answer, but it's not the only correct answer, but it's an important one. The reason why you choose the instructional materials that you do is because they support students in achieving the learning objectives. And, of course, we've said this a number of times, achieving the learning objectives. But it's one thing that we know. It. The next question is, do your students know it? Do your students know why you've chosen the material? Do your students know what to expect from the materials uh, and why they are important? Now, I, I want to ask you to feel free to post your answers uh, in the chat area. Do your students know why you include uh, this material? It's something that you talk about. Okay, now I could say, hey, yeah, <laughs> it's something that I think is really important, uh, especially if, if the book that I'm using is, is uh, very expensive. They need to have a rationale for why they're doing all this stuff, and not just buying the information, but actually reading it as well. Like Matt is typing up right here, and as Matt is typing, let's see, I always provide an objective or desired I, uh, obje outcome for using this resource or performing uh, an assignment. Absolutely. That's great, Matt. Uh, I think that's, that, that's a wonderful way of approaching it. Uh, and if students don't have that, it's been my experience that students can feel that, that the choice of content that we're using is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, they don't really understand uh, why, why I've chosen a particular uh, textbook one particular textbook over another, uh, and they're not thinking about the cost, you know, especially if it's an expensive one, they may think that we're not concerned about the cost. Uh, right here, Bill, to help their careers after graduation. Very important. What's essential, Matt says, likewise, particularly hard or frustrating resources, I'll stress how it will pay off ultimately and provide past students feedback for how frustrating but helpful the resource is. So Bill and Matt are, uh, are in unison in this idea as to why it's so important for students to be able to know that, why it's important to communicate why you've chosen the material and how it's going to help uh, reaching the outcomes. Um, and, and it makes a huge difference in the classroom climate in general, and particularly how students feel and are motivated to engage with the material that you select. All right, so this is an, another reason why you might want to do it. It gives them a reason to, to read the material, to go through the material, to un understand the material. So I'm going to give recommendations on, on what you should do to include, um, to benefit the students' understanding of, of why it's so important that, that they understand why they're being asked to, to review, to, re to read the content that you're sharing with them. 
And one recommendation would be to include a short description in each assigned content item that explains why you chose it and what students can expect to learn from it. Now, I'm not saying that you have to do this every time, all the time, but somewhere you should describe why you selected a particular textbook. And that might be actually the first session of, of the class, or it might be something you include in, the, um, in your, your course syllabus. So, for instance, it's, I have chosen this textbook because it does these things, blah, you know, and whatever they, and they should, of course, align with your course objectives. Um, so it might mean that, that you make it explicit that you're connecting the content with the objectives and you're showing your students how they align. And there are multiple benefits from doing something like this. It helps the students understand the course des design decisions. And ultimately, that can help increase satisfaction. Now students are not blindly going and, and, and picking up a book and reading it. And now they have a justification for doing that. It also can motivate students to review the material because it answers that all important question, what's in it for me? Why should I need to do this? It tells them why this material is, is valuable and why it's a sign. Okay, and it could be that because it'll, it'll prepare me for this particular assignment. It also can establish a connection, uh, for instance, uh, between topics and sources. So if you have, maybe have a source that is, is, we have multiple sources and they're not all in agreement, it actually uh, offers uh, students the opportunity to look at the differences of, uh, of opinion between two, these two sources. And so they can read both of the sources and they can evaluate the argument on one side or the other. So it helps them learn before they engage in the material. If you tell them up front, uh, and this ultimately uh, will result in activating their cognitive networks. Uh, it, uh, it can be very important in, in allowing them to understand and, and preparing them for how to store the material and ultimately helping them become more effective and more efficient learners. So there are a variety of ways of, of doing this. Um, I had mentioned about including a particular, uh, a short description for each item. But let's give some examples. Uh, for instance, you might have a short description that's posted with an assigned material. And so maybe in the beginning, first part of the semester, maybe in one or module one or unit one, you actually describe why is it important to read this chapter of this book. Uh, and maybe that you explain, you provide an explanation of the purpose of the goals at the beginning of a recorded or live presentation. This is something actually that, that I do every week is I have a weekly greeting and I tell the students, what are we doing this week? And I'll and I maybe even share the instructional objectives for this, a particular module, uh, but also provide the rationale for why it's important to read a specific chapter in the book that's assigned for that week uh, and how it will allow them to respond to the discussion board assignment um, and also to be able to successfully uh, complete a weekly quiz. Another way uh, of doing this is to, uh, is to provide an overall assessment of all the assigned readings in a weekly introduction video. Oh, I think I've already set that one already. Okay, well, that's fine. Uh, this, is, this is really important because it connects you with the students, especially if uh, you have an entirely online course and they never really see you. So you can do this uh, either with a video or uh, I like to use, I actually I do a video in my initial introduction uh, with the students to the course because I, I don't see them. But every week I have an audio recording of the weekly greeting and tells them you know, what, what we're gonna be doing. So I wanna ask you, does anyone else have other suggestions? How might you incorporate a short description for each assigned content area? Is there another thing, maybe something that you've already done or maybe something you're thinking about doing? Maybe study guide or guided notes would help. Absolutely. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to reach out to the students to be able to share that information in a different format so that students are aware of that. Thank you, Natalie. Okay, so at this point, I wanna ask you guys a question, but this time, instead of, instead of putting it in the chat area, I'd like you to select, so I'm gonna do a poll and I want you, uh, I want to ask you, do you include optional content that's outside the scope of the learning objectives? Okay, so let me just go, let me just go to share this poll. And so here we go. I got four choices. 
Okay, so now I have, you probably, let's see. So yeah, I've got uh, A, B, C, and, and D. Probably what you're seeing is one, two, three, and four. Okay, Niyati, uh, if you could put down four, um, that would be great in the poll. And, and actually right here, if, if I'm looking at this thing, what Nati says that she actually chooses B and C, which is yes, to refresh them on prere prerequisites. It's a good opportunity to do that. And also to provide opportunities to extend their learning very, very nice. Good way of, of including that. So we've got three people who, uh, let me just show the responses. Okay, so three people say that they, yes, to provide uh, opportunities for for learning. And, and then uh, we got uh, two other people who say, actually two people that say uh, to provide opportunities for extended learning. And two people who say yes, both B and C, which is to refresh them on, on prerequisites and to provide opportunities uh, for additional learning. Thank you so much. All right, so uh, this would be something that would be outside the scope of your course. And, and so this is something that you might want to consider having additional information because uh, perhaps maybe, let me give an example, like maybe you're teaching a course in physics and you might include a refresher on math as, uh, so that uh, your students will be more effective in looking at your particular content. So some examples would be to, uh, to help students make up work that wasn't covered in high school or maybe they're a transfer student uh, from another college, so maybe a JC. Um, so you're providing this information to sort of catch them up. Or you might provide a refresher on a course in the field that uh, that maybe they took the course, a course similar to this a while back, and in sort of in, in order to to refresh them, you might add this additional material. And you may not say that that it's that it's required. In fact, the whole reason for this is that it's optional content, so that students can have the option of going back and reading if they feel they have a need to do that. It also can support relearning of material that they learned but uh, did not have to apply because you're using it now in a different context. So other reasons to include optional content uh, would be to extend learning. Uh, it's an opportunity to add content, perhaps maybe in the area of multiculturalism and diversity. If the material that you have, say your textbook, uh, takes a very narrow approach. So it provides multiple voices to help students understand complex material. It also allows students to explore a topic in more detail. So for instance, if there's a topic that because of uh, of, of time considerations, you don't really have enough uh, sufficient time to be able to go to it in, in depth. You may provide an optional piece of uh, material or an item that actually asks ask a student to be able to go in at their, their convenience to be able to pursue something that they ha have a genuine interest in. So it allows students to explore a topic in greater detail. Sometimes students are so taken by one aspect of the course because like I mentioned, you've skimmed over it. So you provide them additional materials that would they would be interested in in order to allow them to to provide more information to to dig deeper to learn more about this information. Now th this is tying into the concept of uh, of learning, uh, andragogy, I should say. It's a theory of teaching adult learners where you provide choice and options for self actualization. This is one key way to motivate adult learners. You also have an opportunity for students to become experts by having them find resources and maybe even sharing them with classmates. Uh, and also incorporate current events or recent uh, findings to enrich the materials that you have. So maybe you have something that needs to be updated. Uh, and in fact, something that maybe the students would, would benefit greatly from. So it's an opportunity for you to include additional information, perhaps optional information, that would be more enriching to the students. But I want to make sure that uh, it's that you make a clear distinction between required and optional content. And sometimes this might require uh, a separate folder or menu item, so that students know that oh, this is not required. Uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, that may be that students will say, "Oh, good, I don't have to read it." Uh, but you want to want to make it attractive enough that students will be uh, motivated to be able to do that to show that how they can benefit from that. So you may uh, identify in the list of assigned readings, this is required or this is optional. And, and in some way, actually, it's very important that however you do it, however you, you, whether you create a separate folder or identify a list of assigned materials, that you do it in a consistent manner to identify the title or uh, the description of the materials. Uh, also, I wanna, wanted to mention the need for 
using academic citations uh, format that's suitable for your discipline when you're introducing materials. And why would that be? Why would it be so important to do that? I think probably the, the primary reason is that you're establishing a model for your students to follow. Exactly, Matt, you and I are thinking the same way. To provide a, a, a model for your students, yes, absolutely. Uh, sometimes students are not aware that there is an existing a preferable citation format for one field. It may be Chicago style, it may be APA, um, but students need to know that if they're in a specific area of study, a discipline, that there are appropriate ways to be able to cite information. So you also want to do it to provide all the information that the students will need to find it from another source or an alternative format. So if the students, maybe there's a, you're using a PDF and the PDF is really uh, not screen readable. And so by providing the specific information on how to find it, they may find an alternative source that actually is screen readable. So you want to make sure that the students have that information to be able to do the search uh, when necessary. Uh, also, I mentioned before, thank you so much, Matt. You were ahead of the game. It models good practice, and it demonstrates your commitment to academic integrity. You want to clearly communicate instructional materials to your students by using a consistent structure, which I had mentioned. Use uh, a standard academic citation format, so this is kind of a summary of that, to help students understand why and how to use instructional materials because you're giving them a, a rational or a purpose for doing that, and to clearly designate required versus optional uh, materials. So let me give you an example from, this is actually from a, a colleague of mine, Stephanie Richter. And so this is, uh, this is something she uses in her own course, but she has a consistent structure. It remains the same for each module. So she has reading and resources. And so that will be the, the folder that uh, this would go into. So she has textbook readings. And she has the specific citation. It's proper academic citation style. So now the students are aware of that. She's talking about this particular uh, textbook and the chapters four and five. But in addition to that, she is providing guidance for the reading. So she, she may say that, yeah, well, I want you to focus more on chapter 10 as it is more practical of the two chapters, four and two. So I'm sure that they're going to be reading both chapters, but they're going to focus more on chapter 10. And now the students are aware of that. So it, it's made clear to the students what they need to do. But in addition, students are also provided with additional resources that are recommended, but they're not required. So they're optional uh, material. And she clearly marks them as optional material. And then this is really important so that the students who want to seek out further information, want to explore, actually can seek out this right here um, and, and use their time in a very uh, efficient way. So while our quality online workshop series, and this is just one, uh, one workshop in that series on course content and materials, well, this focuses on online teaching in general and what is good online course design looks like overall. I do want to highlight how these topics align with Quality Matters rubric. Now, what is Quality Matters? Quality Matters is recognized by NIU because NIU has officially adopted Quality Matters as a course design rubric and a course review process. You can find out more about Quality Matters in the first webinar in this series, and it's called Ensuring Quality in Your Online Courses. In fact, we have an archive uh, on our website that you can actually look at that. I'll, I'll follow up with a link to that so you can look at that to find out more of, a, of an overview of what Quality Matters is really like. But today's workshop really aligns with Standard 4 in the Quality Matters rubric. It's all about instruction materials and the content of your course. And from that perspective, quality courses use historical or seminal instruction materials that support learning objectives through diverse voices and multiple modalities with clearly communicated purpose and use, proper citation, and obvious distinction between required and optional materials. So as a brief summary, instructional materials should support your learning objectives. I think we're all aware of that. You should also use a variety of instructional materials, both found and created. So those that you discovered and those that you really need to create to fill in any missing gaps and also to allow you to, to include your own voice in, in your content, which of course you really want to do. And then finally, to communicate instructional materials clearly, including a purpose, a citation, and whether it's required or optional. So that students are now have a completely different approach to the content. They're, they're uh, as I like to use in my own, uh, my own course, uh, fully informed consent. Okay, so now they are completely aware of what they're getting and how to use it. 
and what's expected of them. All right. So what uh, what questions do you have? Any questions about creating and discovering content? Any questions about communication? Okay, so I see Natalie is typing. None for me. Oh, okay, great. Thank you so much, Natalie. No questions on this. All right. So uh, if there are no more questions, then I'd like to... Um, the video tutorial option, I plan to use, oh, <laughs> Natalie, you know, I've used this uh, in the past and had very positive feedback from students. Like I say, initially what I have is just an introduction to uh, to the course and, and to myself and who I am and all that. And that's a video. In fact, what I'll do is I'll, I'll include a link to that video that I use in my course. But every week I have a weekly greeting and I have it made available on Monday, 12.01 in the morning on Monday, which actually sort of sets out what we're going to be talking about for the, for the upcoming week. It also talks about maybe if there's anything undone or unsaid or incomplete from the previous week, especially if we've had a uh, if we've had a discussion board assignment in which the students uh, had some really interesting issues and maybe even got into some sort of a discussion outside of that, that I can address. Or maybe something in uh, in the news happened that I can bring up that wasn't part of uh, the previous week's uh, comment, but actually happened during the week. So it was material that happened while I was actually uh, had posted material already. So maybe after the fact and say, oh, by the way, you know, there was this uh, there was this news story of this uh, of this nurse that was uh, accosted by a police officer when she tried to defend uh, the uh, the rules of the hospital and the rules of her profession and how that was unjust. So uh, this is something I, that I can do. And also, if there's maybe perhaps maybe an upcoming. Uh, midterm, uh, final examination, or maybe an assignment that's due, it gives me an opportunity to say, okay, uh, just to let you know that we do have an assignment due next to we next Wednesday or next Friday. Please be aware of that. I expect to, you know, to to, to be reviewing all of your uh, material that you've submitted. So, because it's not something we can do in a face-to-face -face setting, because we don't have a face-to-face -face setting, it is something that that allows me. To, um, to reach out to the students and to have uh, additional information uh, provided to them. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention in this that uh, I really like to use a lot is the use of announcements. Because announcements, not only, not just because you know of, of stuff that I do every single semester, the same type of announcements would go at a certain point, but sometimes there's something new that happens and I want my students to be able to get that information immediately. And I have the option when I post the announcement to have it sent out as an email. So students not only get it in the course, but also get it uh, posted in their uh, in their email, university assigned email accounts. Okay, any last comments or questions? Doesn't look like there there is. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for your uh, your contributions. You've all had some some interesting insights um, and willingness to share. I will uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill, uh, Nurhan, uh, Natalie. I appreciate all that you did, and of course, Matt. Niyati, thank you so much. All right. So I want to wish you uh, well. I'm going to follow up this presentation with an email and with the PowerPoint presentation that I've used it and, and some links that I had mentioned earlier on. All right. I want to wish you all well for the rest of the day. Take care.